We're live here at DotConf, Splunk's user conference. Uh, we're at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Uh, I'm Jeff Kelly from Wikibon.org, and we're really uh, happy right now to welcome uh, CEO of Splunk, CEO and Chairman, Godfrey Sullivan. Thank you, glad to be here. Well, thanks for joining us, really nice. appreciate it. Um, so, geez, what an event, a thousand plus people. You guys are you know, doing uh, quite well. Uh, you had a great quarter, just ended. Thank you. Uh, after a successful IPO in April. So uh, how do you feel? You guys are on uh, quite, a, quite a streak right now. Well, the thing that always makes us the happiest is when we have a lot of customers around us. So having 1,000 customers here in Las Vegas has everybody in the Splunk world just thrilled. So we've added 400 new customers in our most recently completed quarter. So 4,500 customers is just, that's, that makes us really happy. Yeah, that's great. And, and also the fact that you've got repeat customers, because as an old-time salesman, you know, it's always easier to get the repeat order than the first order. So the fact that you're landing in at, uh, at a low friction point or a relatively easy high value uh, solution and then seeing your customers, I read in the analyst call, continue to expand the use of the platform. Right? Because great. it's something they couldn't do before or they just see the, you know, the bright light pops on that, wow, we can do this and we can do that. That's got to make you really happy. Well, Splunk's a really unique product in my experience. I mean, where else can you down some, download something off the web, use it for a while, installation is a few minutes and going live in a, in a small instance is maybe a day, and then grow with that experience over time. And so a lot of our customers who convert from a free license to some sort of paid license typically only spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, something like that. But you heard in our, our quarterly earnings report that 70% of our revenues were at, came from our existing customer base. Yeah, so it's pretty amazing that a product can be that easy to download, that quick to install and get running, and yet scale to the kind of volumes where our customers are learning from it and then expanding their use of it. And of course, they, they pay us a little bit when that happens, but it's a, very, it's a mutual benefit relationship. And so, right. yeah, we're, we're, we're very fortunate. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in your keynote this morning, you said something which I found interesting that uh, you know three years ago, trying to explain to a CEO at a company what machine data is, why it's important, how you can leverage it for you know for value, it was a very kind of a tough conversation to have, and it's right. gotten a lot easier over the last three years. That's right. Can you talk a little bit about why that is, and, and explain to our audience what what really makes the machine data specifically such a valuable asset to uh, to exploit? Sure. Well, it's. It's been a challenge to say to someone, you should look at your log files. Let's just, let's just take machine data down to its, its slogan or mm -hmm. its, uh, you know, the slang terminology for a moment. If you said, gee, there's to a, a CIO, there's a lot of data and, and value in your log files. And they just say, really? I mean, I was, back when I used to run Hyperion, we were a software development company. We just thought about log files as being those things that the developers, developers spit out to try to find errors in their code or some sort of other, and as long as they were happy, we were happy. But you never thought about that being a, we were a BI company, we never thought about getting intelligence out of logs. Thought never occurred to us. <laughs> we, looked for, we looked at a lot of data, and we delivered intelligence out of a lot of data. All of it on the structured side. You're looking at customer names and product ID codes and, and comparing revenues from one quarter to another. You'd never think about looking into a log file to see if there was something of value in there. I think what Eric and Rob and the founding team really did that was so innovative was to say, if, if, a, if a transaction went inside one side of the IT blender and never came out the other side, why not? And they started to they use that as the foundation problem to go, to go create this search engine. And from that, found that there was a lot of value in that data. So it's a kind of a new concept. And, and as a result, it's taken a while to educate the world mm -hmm. on Gee, there's real value in your logs. There's real value in your in your IT data or your machine data, your device generated data, and that's just exploded now with the internet coming of age, internet transactions, mobile devices. The, the amount of volume that has, is now being created has just exploded. But now, uh, execs, even old software execs, are beginning to understand there's a lot of value in that machine data if you just harvest it, analyze it, and and ask it a question. Right, right. So you, you've done a great job in, in ex taking advantage of this data that heretofore could, could right. not be used. Right. What's the next big challenge? So we're, we're having, you got a great infrastructure, people are, are buying the software, they're using the software, it's innovating like crazy. So from your point of view, from the CEO point of view, what's the next hill? Kind of what's the next, not necessarily over the, over the horizon hill, but the next kind of sure. challenge that the, you and the team are trying to, uh, to take down? Sure. 
Well, what's becoming mainstream is that the IT organizations around the world are starting to understand what Splunk is. You know, the IPO is really helpful to us in terms of it's a branding event. It raises your profile of the brand itself, the name of the company. So we've really seen an increased awareness, an increased recognition factor. Folks are saying, oh, I heard about you, I read about you. That, that's really one of the things that an IPO does for you besides give you a new set of investors is right. it actually right. is an important branding event. So that's really helped uh, increase the velocity of our mainstream business. Think of it as the IT version of machine data. Right. Sort of over the next hill we talked about in the keynote this morning, which is what about all those uses beyond IT? Where, where other types of machine generated data could provide real value, like the, har the, the exhaust of a jet airplane engine, or the information coming from your car's computer, or the information coming from a medical device, right. the information coming from uh, from other types of mobile devices that so or social media streams. And so we have customers who are actually presenting sessions here on things like building management. You know, what what what's the operational intelligence that comes out of an elevator? Right. right. So all the devices of the world, the machines are starting to spit out digital data, and that sort of next thing is how do we both do a great job within IT, but expand Splunk's vision and reach beyond IT to enable all the rest of the machines of the world to be able to talk back to us and right. have us listen to them and understand where their value is. So and and as it's just fault, we're all kind of virtual machines now because yeah. we're carrying around the mobile devices, we're logged in, we're interacting with applications That's right. That's and, right. and things all the time. So, yeah. the, like I said, the machine is no longer just a machine. It's, it's the connectivity to us that's generating so much machine that's right. data. And we can't live without it. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> we're all hooked. <laughs> so I, I'm interested to talk a little bit about, so what are some of the implications for the enterprise? We're talking about all these different types of data and different use cases. It can be a little overwhelming. Um, so what are some of the challenges in terms of, for your customers, in terms of maybe culturally or even organizationally, putting themselves in a position where they can really start taking advantage of this kind of uh, new capabilities that Splunk provides. Right, it's really a learning experience. You know, it's, uh, it's like when the, one of our customers came in from, from Japan and, and I saw her in the hallway and asked her, what, why are you here? Why are you in California? And she said, well, we've, Splunk has made us aware that we need to listen to our machine data. And so we think we can take the elevator data that's, you know, our elevator data and create intelligence out of it. I said, how in the world do you do that? She said, well, you know, everybody has a, 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 car, a, a personal access card and the elevators all have computer controls in them now. So all we have to do is splunk all that data and we'd be able to see which buildings are, are in most danger, which buildings have economic either uh, energy coming their way or risk that we can look at. Uh, uh, traffic going to floors or into specific suites gives us a better leading economic indicator of a building's health. In fact, she said the elevator is probably the best way to understand the future economic health of a building. Interesting. You think, wow, that's a pretty good concept. I never thought about elevators that way. So our customers continue to give us all these new exciting ideas about what where the devices of the world can, right. can help us. So, you know, the big challenge for customers is just thinking about it that way. Right. How do you learn about this new type of data? And yeah. how do you then think about how to get the, the intelligence out of it? It seems very kind of chicken and egg. You know, yeah. how did she think of that? You know, who was it? Some some guy that works at the at the uh, at the lobby that noticed that suddenly no one's coming in and out anymore. The building and and, and sure enough, the, the company defaults and the the building comes available. Or is it is it now being able to to play with the data, if you will, in ways that you couldn't before? That then provides the insight to think of new ways to do it. Do you have any idea in the, in the elevator case kind of who came up with that idea and then actually was able to validate it yeah. uh, with software? Well, I don't know in that case, but I'd say in most cases with our customers, it's that we start in IT, the IT guys get to know what it is, and then the light bulb goes on. Okay. And they go, wow, if we can do that with Splunk, then we need to go talk to our colleagues in other departments. Right. And so Splunk is a good example of a, a unique technology that kind of tears down the organizational boundaries. So before Splunk, the guys in security had software that was narrowly used for that purpose. And they rarely had a, chance, a reason to go down the hall and talk to one of their peers in another department about it, except just to update a status or something. Splunk is one of those rare technologies where the more data you put in, the more value you get back. So now the security guys have a reason to go down and talk to the people in applications development or in infrastructure, or maybe even in this case over into operations and say, hey, have you guys thought about it? your data this way. Hmm. So I'd say in most of our customer cases, it starts in IT, 
the guys over there, the light bulb goes on, they get it, and then they start reaching out to other departments to say, hey, have you guys thought about this? So it's pretty cool. Interesting. <laughs> Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is, is definitely a lot more interest uh, from the enterprise in terms of virtualization. Mm -hmm. We were at uh, VMware uh, not too long ago. I think actually Splunk was there, gave a presentation as well. That's right. Um, but I'm interested, uh, you know, so Splunk kind of got its start uh, back in the mid-2000s, but now, you know, virtualization has come on strong over the last couple of years. So how does that impact your, what you do in terms of uh, evaluating an infra IT infrastructure? And does that add complications? And, uh, how does Splunk uh, kind of adapt in this new kind of world of virtualization and cloud computing? Well, virtualization adds one more layer of complexity to the IT stack. So while you're getting the economies of knowing that you can run multiple VMs inside of a physical device, mm -hmm. you've now abstracted away from the physical device some of that information. So when something goes wrong in your, with your application or your security or your customer accounts or any other type of activity, how do you how do you get at that data? So we've worked closely with VMware and Citrix and other companies in the virtualization category to say, help us get that data so that we can then ingest it, analyze it, correlate it with other, other types of data. So to us, it's just another very important data source. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is, of course, uh, the big data, kind of big data analyzing big data. Um, I know you've got a lot of partners here and, and other firms you work with, uh, Hortonworks among others are here, right. uh, the Hadoop world. Mm -hmm. How does uh, kind of Splunk kind of fit into that larger big data landscape? Sure. And you know, how, what is your relationship with kind of the, the, the Hadoop side of the equation? Mm -hmm. um, do you work with helping you know, Hadoop administrators kind of understand the Hadoop environment, which really is one of the, the big issues in, in that particular field in terms of adoption and uh, spurring adoption to kind of the management tools and kind of understanding what's going on inside your cluster? Sure. Well, I'm on the road all the time and talk to lots of IT execs, and one of the most common things I hear is, we have lots of data, we don't know what to do with it, so we're standing up a Hadoop stack, our Hadoop cluster, and we're going to put a lot of data in there, and if we ever need it, or if we have to go back and ask it a question, at least we'll have it. If you ask them, well, what's, was there a specific problem you were trying to solve, often they haven't gotten that far yet. They're just knowing they need to fire hose in lots and lots of data, and so it, so Hadoop is a beautiful, cheap, batch storage system. It's a great file system for just putting all kinds of different data into it, and it doesn't cost anything from a software standpoint to do it. It costs a lot from a hardware standpoint, development, and how to get it back out. So we think this is a huge opportunity to provide value to those, those big data sets, which is to connect Splunk to it so that you can, from a really easy user interface, you don't have to hire lots of data scientists or do lots of programming work, you hook Splunk to it and you say, go get that data, let me analyze it the Splunk way. Or maybe I've indexed it through Splunk on the way in and then you go drop it into the Hadoop cluster for long-term cheap storage. So we think there's a big opportunity to both add value to that universe by being able to analyze that, make it easier to analyze that data, uh, and also be able to monitor those big stacks. You get those big clusters in place and they, and they break. I mean, things go wrong. <laughs> yep. it's, compl it's a complex ac application and file environment. Right. So we might as well apply Splunk to it. That's what we do. Right. So uh, we look at it as a very interesting complementary opportunity. Good. I want to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned it a little bit in the keynote on Splunk for good. And, and obviously, as a successful company with, with a few dollars in the bank and, a, and, a, and it sounds like a really great culture, you have an opportunity that you can look outside of kind of your core customers and your core business activities. And, and, and obviously, somebody said global warming is a big data problem. I heard that mm -hmm. quote the other day. So can you talk a little bit about Splunk for Good and some of those efforts that you and the company are doing to, to, to take advantage of what you've created? Love to. Well, Splunk for Good, simply put, is our ability, our, our hope, our aspiration to be an advocate for making data open as often as possible. And being able to reach out to people like state governments, local governments, to be able to publish that information so that it's accessible to the community at large. The more data that's published, the more knowledge and richness there is available for all of us as citizens. And so, for example, uh, we have a, I had a customer, a partner in from uh, Rio just last week, and they were working with the local government down there to understand road sensor data, traffic signals, and everything else. It's, it's all there. It's all available if, the, if, if it will be published. Once it's published, we can index it into Splunk, and they are, they are contemplating using Splunk so that they can better manage traffic. So just think about how bad traffic is in Rio and, and parts like that, just any major metropolitan area. If you're actually going to have an impact 
on global warming or just traffic density or people's ability to get to work, you need to understand when a traffic signal fails or a road is blocked or some other thing, how do you, how do you get that information? What do you do with it? How do you take an act, proactive management uh, action towards it so you can remedy that situation? We can provide an enormous amount of value there and we have to make sure that especially governments are get, you know, start to be more and more open about publishing their data. The other thing we're doing with Splunk for Good is we're advocating uh, to nonprofits all over the world. If you need Splunk, here's what we can do for you. Come get free free software, and we'll help you get it get it up and running. And our customers in, are involved at the community level with nonprofits everywhere. So for them to know that and know that they can do some outreach there would be really good. So we're we're excited about it. That's great. Cool. So uh, you know, in terms of looking forward. Uh, Obviously, we're in kind of a tough economic situation here in the U.S. and in Europe. Is troubles are well known. Maybe worse. Yeah, <laughs> could be could be a little bit worse. Uh, so, but you know, I, I mentioned in our intro earlier today. Uh, I believe it's 19 straight quarters of double-digit revenue growth at, mm. at Splunk. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable. That goes right through the the recession and, and the downturn. So, uh, what's your kind of outlook going forward in terms of uh, you know business, especially when we're seeing some of the larger uh, kind of what you might call mega vendors, IT mega vendors, are seeing a pullback in, in some spend. How, how does that impacting your business and big data in, in general? I don't want to go too far and say big data is recession proof, but is it? Big data isn't recession proof. Customers have to have a, a need for something specific or they won't spend money on it. So I don't see, uh, I don't see big data projects per se being recession proof. As we look out though, we have a very ambitious product agenda. So we have teams uh, building Splunk Enterprise. We announced Splunk Storm a few weeks ago for general availability. We're expanding that team. That's your cloud-based. Uh, our cloud, uh, cloud offering, our SaaS offering. Uh, we're building apps and content. And we have a new team that we're investing in up in Seattle to build the SDKs to help extend Splunk further in, for developers. So with, we have a very ambitious product agenda and customers appreciate that and are asking us for more. We, we can only do that by investing really heavily. So part of what we've told our new investors from Wall Street is, you'll have to bear with us because right now we're in a high growth phase and we don't expect to be profitable. We'll be cash flow profitable, but not gap or non-gap profitable. We are investing every dollar we make into additional development resources, field coverage, professional services, support. So when you're, when you're expanding your customer base as quickly as we are, you have to stay in high investment mm -hmm. mode. So, you know, none of those businesses are, no, no business is recession proof, but we happen to be in a high growth mode and we need to continue to invest as heavily as we can to match the customer requirements. So. Good. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. I you know you're very busy here at uh, no, no. Splunk.com. <laughs> here comes the fun part, which is for the next three days, we get to uh, go attend those customer sessions and find out all the creative things our customers are doing with Splunk. And that's the most fun part about it. For those of us that work at Splunk, we're going right to the customer sessions. Awesome. awesome. You know, when they're done with their sessions, send them right over to the queue. <laughs> exactly. And we'll blast right. it out to our community. Right, so Jeff. thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Jeff, thank, thank you. you. And we'll be uh, back after uh, just a moment uh, with our next guest.